Hey, 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. Today, I'm interviewing our chief science officer, Eric Helms, to discuss all things programming considerations. Now, programming considerations are not the same as exercise selection or modification, which are things we've covered on the show before. But this episode will show you that it's more about the interaction between exercises, where fatigue and muscle damage can and will occur, how our anatomical structures are set up, and a whole lot more things that Eric will tell you about over the next hour. We think programming considerations are so important that we've included a section of them in every single one of our chapters in the 3DMJ Lifting Library. And for those who haven't heard of the Lifting Library, let me quickly tell you all about it and how you can save a bunch of money if you buy it within the next six days. The Lifting Library is our all-in-one video course solution to perfecting the essential movements and exercises that every bodybuilder needs to know and execute well. We just released new videos yesterday, and the course now includes a total of 36 chapters covering every classic barbell and dumbbell lift, loads of body weight and machine exercises, warm-ups, BFR training, and even a chapter on how to build a program. Each of those exercise chapters has a super detailed instructional video with multiple angles, freeze frames with graphics, and educational voiceovers by Eric. Each one also has a text-based supplemental section that outlines those key performance takeaways, and most importantly, a programming considerations section, which we will be discussing at length here in the next hour. We just released the Lifting Library version 5 yesterday, December 15th, and the new batch includes decline press, cable flies and crossovers, ham curl variations, face pulls, upright rows, and back extensions. And we're running a sale this week only, so you can get full lifetime access to all current and future updates for just $50 if you buy now. The price will go back up to the standard rate of $68 on Wednesday, December 22nd, so get it ASAP, buy your lifetime access pass, and save some money because it goes up every time we have a new update. If you already have access to the Lifting Library because you bought a previous version or because you're a Vault VIP member, go to your dashboard at 3dmjvault.com and go check out the new videos that are there waiting for you at no extra cost. But if you don't already have the Lifting Library, now is the time to buy and save your 18 bucks because we only release new content with sales once or twice a year. You can do that at 3dmjvault.com. Again, that's 3dmjvault.com. Woo! Okay, that's my big pitch. We won't have another ad in the middle of this episode. Just wanted to get it all out right now and tell you before we dive in. So let's get into it. Here is our episode all about programming considerations with our chief science officer, Eric Helms. So Eric, when you're writing the programming considerations for the lifting library chapters, could you give me like a framework of like what goes through your head when you're creating those sections? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people understand how to perform exercises and they may look at like the lifting library and be like, oh yeah, that's cool. I've seen those on YouTube. But I think what what really a lot of people miss out on is how do I integrate each one of these tools that I know how to, know how to do into a like a microcycle? Um, or like a week of training, like your, your quote unquote split bro. Um, and there's a lot that goes through my head, you know, over the years of training myself and training others and helping other coaches train their clients, um, you start to see that, okay, everything is interdependent. Like if I want to increase the volume on a given muscle group, you think it might just be as simple as sweet. Every occurrence where I do an exercise that trains that muscle group, I add a set. That will get you there, but then you might start to find out like, oh, I have lingering fatigue that goes into my next day. Or, oh man, I can't actually do that much of quad work from let's say squats because my, my lumbar gets fatigued and then my deadlift suffer two days later. So I go over a lot of things like, all right, here's how this exercise should be used. Here's where you would probably want to place it in relation to other exercises. So when I write a programming considerations for let's say, like lying hamstring curls, I inevitably end up talking about deadlifts or other hip hinges and like what's going on on Monday versus say Wednesday or Friday. So I can help the reader and the watcher, I guess, understand um, 
what do I do with understanding this exercise now? Where can I put it and why would it impact the performance of other movements and how would it fit into the grand scheme of a, like a bodybuilding program in most instances where we're talking about the, the bodybuilding movements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, when does that become more important? Because like we have the muscle and strength pyramids that have like a program and it's like compounds mm -hmm. before accessories. And when does that stop being that easy? And then we go into like all the things you just said, or is it ever that easy? Yeah, it's, it's the generalities are, I mean, they're really useful. Don't get me wrong. I could be, but I don't think like if, if, if you and I were like, you know what, third edition muscle and strength pyramids, let's cover every exercise. That would be a, like a, a 10 volume, like Bible, you know? Yeah. So, um, the Old Testament would be would be ashamed of how short it was compared to that, just because there's so many ways we can move our bodies yeah. and so many interactions between those movements. So it's, I think the best you can do in a, a fundamental kind of uh, principle-based book is to teach those rules, quote unquote rules, I guess, that are most often correct. Um, and you can help someone understand kind of like I'm doing this in this podcast episode as we get a little more into the weeds, um, what would you make the decisions based on, you know? Um, it's kind of like the whole, it's the difference between, I would say, uh, the actual coaching interaction you might have with Jeff, Berto, and Brad versus us on the podcast talking about a specific topic and how we make our decisions. And I think that's why our podcast is cool, because you get to see what thought processes we use to make coaching decisions. But if we wanted to cover all of the coaching decisions, it would be like some, it would require like an AI algorithm or some shit um, that we don't yet have so the technology So 10 years from for. now, we'll have that for you. Correct. When Skynet is <laughs> also uh, combining with the Matrix and we are being used as batteries, and uh, then at that point, if we were free and not controlled by the machines, we could have that. Yeah, because Meta is, is a thing now, so I'm sure Zucks will have that for us. Yeah, I, I can't wait for that feature on uh, can't wait on, on social media. <laughs> <laughs> but can you like explain how this programming is it, programming considerations differs from exercise selection? Yes. So okay. Yeah, I, I think they overlap a lot um, because first you want to understand what does an exercise do for me. So so for example, we'll go back to the the hamstring curl one. Okay. A, your standard gym-based lying hamstring curl, it's a great movement, you know, nothing wrong with it at all. Uh, it targets the hamstrings, but we also know that when it's compared to, say, a seated hamstring curl, uh, it doesn't seem to produce as much hypertrophy. So the the really basic interpretation, well, then I, I would always want to use a seated hamstring curl. Uh, the next level is, well, well, why? Oh, okay, well, it's because you're in a basically a sit and reach position with a seated hamstring curl. So the hamstrings are in an elongated position, so that you produce a little more tension because you're training them in a long muscle length. However, we also understand that that tends to produce more muscle damage. So if all of a sudden your gym gets a seated hamstring curl and you're like, sweet, I'm going to switch and my gains are going to be better, you know, period. Well, it's also going to produce this unaccustomed level of soreness and, and a decrement in performance. So how quickly should you, should you, in, you know, put it into your program? Uh, should you lower the RPE? Should you do as many sets as you did for a lying hamstring curl? If you've got RDLs on Friday and you're doing these hamstring curls on Wednesday, will you still be able to perform RDLs just as well? Or maybe now you move RDLs to Monday and you do these hamstring curls on Wednesday, that type of thing. So something seemingly simple can require a little more thought if you're trying to, because I mean, again, we're talking about like competitive bodybuilding in many cases here. Yeah. So these are maybe not issues for a novice who say training, you know, three times a week with six to eight sets, how you might start out taking things seriously. But if you are trying to get on stage, trying to, you know, really squeeze out every last drop of your off season before you get on stage in two years, hoping to make a difference, then these are the types of T's you should cross and the I's you should dot, you know? Yeah. Um, another thing to consider is, well, you know, when would I use an RDL versus a, a hamstring curl? You know, an RDL definitely also puts you in that sit and reach position at the bottom, uh, but it starts with the eccentric, you know, and it is also training your glutes and your lumbar. Um, so, 
you know, there's some people are more like compound purists and like, yeah, if I, I don't have to do a hamstring curl, why wouldn't I always do just do an RDL? And it's like, well, we need to understand now a little bit about the hamstring anatomy. So yes, the hamstrings are a hip extensor and a knee flexor, but not all four heads. So the short head of the biceps femoris is only a knee flexor. So if we're not doing any knee flexion exercises, and you're an actual competitive bodybuilder, are you going to have as proportionate hamstring development along the whole backside of your leg? No. So, okay. So if I'm a competitive bodybuilder, I probably need to be doing hamstring curls. And I probably also want to be doing hip extension. But I have to think about how that hip extension, a hinge, is going to affect my squatting because they're both training my glutes. They're both training my lumbar. They both are actually loading, putting a lot of joint stress through my body. Uh, and then where do I put that in the week? okay, what's my target volume? If I want to get 12 sets of hamstring work and I'm thinking about training uh, you know, the, the short head of my bicep femoris through knee flexion, I need to train hip extension. Uh, and I also have a little bit of lingering uh, joint stress when I do RDLs, uh, but I also don't want to be sore from anything going to my next one. Then where do I place them all? So that, okay, that's a lot. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> So, but, but that starts to give you the insight into thinking about, okay, so how do I place my exercises? And this is why sometimes I'll get someone, and I think the coaches will have expressed this many times, we'll get their initial application for coaching. And maybe the volume is not even that far off. And the exercise selection is fine. Like most of your basic muscle magazines will explain to you like, here's what you do on chest day. You know, they give you four perfectly fine chest exercises. Right. Um, but does it really make sense to do like incline and then flat and then decline and then dips all in the same day? Like probably not. Like wh why would we do that if we could optimize the performance? Because obviously there's going to be a lot of overlap. You're doing essentially the same thing, like four horizontal presses in a row, right? Yeah. So could we get more out of putting those on different days, thinking about which ones go first? Okay, well, incline presses trying to hit, tend to hit the anterior deltoid more. So where am I going to put my overhead press now in the week? Like all of that stuff, I think is what often most lifters don't have the experience or the knowledge or a combination of the two to kind of take a, a given program and optimize it. And a lot of the time the coaches, which was what I almost finished my sentence on earlier, will take the same total volume and the same given selection of exercises, but distribute it differently so that you're performing better. Um, and just kind of... Uh, optimizing something without really changing the, the fundamentals of, of what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just gave, on the hamstrings, you went hard on like all the things that we could possibly think of. And for the listeners, just so y'all know, every, uh, we do have a chapter on hamstrings. We have, we have a, the little monologue that Eric gave on ham curls, we have that typed out in every chapter throughout the lifting library for every exercise. So, just so you know, that's there. Like Eric tells you, these are the things you need to consider, blah, blah, blah. But because that is so complicated, Eric, I want to ask you, do you have a pyramid for programming considerations, if you will? Mm, absolutely, yeah. So in order so of priorities, what, yeah, mm -hmm. like where, because it is it is a lot. <laughs> and yeah, you do so it for I us. I think what we really need to think about is, all right, so what is quote unquote overlapping fatigue, which is this kind of thing that you will hear me say. But, okay, what are we talking about? In most instances, we're talking about muscle damage, delayed onset muscle soreness, and the the negative effects of that. I mean, it's it that's it's normal. We should have it. You may have far less now than you did when you first started. That's normal too. Uh, you may have set things up so that you're training more frequently, so you just get a lot less DOMS. But we know that any time you do sufficient overloading work, you're going to see a decrement in performance in the days afterwards. Maybe in one or two days. Maybe longer, depending on to what degree uh, that, that muscle damage exists. So the question really is, well, okay, what exacerbates muscle damage? And then how does that fit into this exercise framework? And then how do I distribute them in a week so that there's the least amount of overlap? Okay. That's really what my calculus is. So okay. let's go over some things that, 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 uh, that modify muscle damage. Um, some things are unrelated to exercise selection. How much volume you do and how close to failure you go, right? And so that's kind of, quote unquote, outside of the purview of the programming considerations, but not necessarily. You know, I might mention like, hey, this exercise inherently tends to cause a little more muscle damage. And it is also putting you in a biomechanically 
you know, challenging position and it's a full body movement, maybe don't go to a high RPE all the time. Like that's what I normally advise for the RDL. RDLs to failure, it's a little higher risk, higher reward, and maybe not for a lot, a lot of, not maybe that juice isn't worth the squeeze for, for doing like RPE tents all the time. Um, so that stuff is separate from exercises. Uh, what is not though, is thinking about uh, the muscle length at which tension is applied. So let's think about that. If we were to do a dumbbell fly, right? So we got dumbbells in our hands. As we go to the very bottom, now we've got this long lever arm. If we think about just uh, the, the physics of it, you know, we're the anchoring point at our shoulder and the weight all the way out at the end of our hand. That is when the load is going to be the quote unquote heaviest for us. It's still the same load, but we have to produce the most torque to start lifting it back up. However, when you're at the top of that dumbbell fly, when your arm is perpendicular to the ground and it's basically just your joints are stacked and you're holding a dumbbell straight up, it's not hard at all. You're just kind of balancing it in your hands. Um, so there's two things that are happening simultaneously there. When your pec is the shortest, the tension is the least at the very top, right? And when your pec is the longest, the tension is the highest. So at that point at the bottom, and if you're using a pretty full range of motion on flies, you're producing high tension with a long muscle length. So that's a great combination for making something produce a fair amount of soreness and damage and, and create a drop in performance. So like heavy, hard dumbbell flies close to failure, that's something that seems really normal for you to do. This is an isolation movement. This is a quote unquote finisher in a traditional bodybuilding sense. I would do flies at the very end but they might be causing a whole lot more damage than you might expect, you know? So your chest training now might not be good for 48 hours, you know, literally just because of that exercise compared to, uh, you know, what else you might've done on that day. So what other alternatives are there? Well, you can do cables and then you can actually have a consistent, uh, you know, amount of tension throughout the whole range of motion. It's still going to be highest when you're most elongated. Um, but, uh, you can start thinking about these exercises in a way is like, all right, so what's going to make me unable to perform my best in, in, in recent proximity to other things? And then where would I put it? Because um, most of the time we think in very general terms that are not always 100% accurate, like isolation movements, less fatiguing than compound movements. And I think that's a great rule of thumb. But in that example we just gave, if you were to do, let's say, 50 pound dumbbell presses and that's your your 10 rep max and maybe you can only do say 15 or 17.5 pound dumbbell flies for 10. the dumbbell flies probably make you sore you know even though we see it as an isolation movement versus a compound so that's when that uh the exception to the rule is something we need to consider um so yeah long muscle lengths uh also things that have a a pretty exaggerated eccentric where the eccentric is under a lot of control um, so most of the time people will find that RDLs make them sore than, uh, than deadlifts. So we're seeing a combination of a couple things here on a deadlift. You don't always fully control the, the way down, you know, you don't have to, you can let gravity do it for you, but most people who aren't gymnasts, Andrea, they don't <laughs> touch the ground with the, the barbell, uh, when they do an RDL, you know, they take it out of the rack and it gets close. Like, you know, I can, uh, you know, I get it like maybe a couple centimeters off the ground. Uh, when I do in range of motion, if I'm not just fully doing back, you know, like uh, hip flexion, if I'm if I'm just kind of stopping at the point where my hips stop traveling backwards and I don't let my knees bend uh, so that they're traveling forward at all, I don't quite touch the ground. So that means it has to be under control the, the whole time. Additionally, if you look at the the starting position of a conventional deadlift and the uh, the bottom quote unquote over an RDL, your hamstrings are a little more stretched because you're purposely trying to kick your hips back as far as you can on the RDL. And in the conventional, you're in a slightly more squatty position, you know, enough that your knees actually start forward, come back and then go forward again, you know? So there's that kind of rebend. And that's enough just to have slightly less elongation of the, of the hamstrings. So the combination of, while it looks like the same movement, you know, an RDL versus a conventional deadlift, RDLs make your hamstrings a lot sore for those two reasons. Uh, even though oftentimes you're using 75% of the load and sometimes not even going to failure. So um, that's the type of thing where the average person thinks, yeah, RDLs are less fatiguing than deadlifts. You know, deadlifts, because they always think they're heavy, they're hard, 
Uh, they're pulling from the floor. You know, that's when your your, your Snap City is is at more risk. You know, <laughs> but if I had to go right, when am I going to do hamstring curls? Am I going to do it two days after uh, regular deadlifts or RDLs? I would be more confident in my performance doing them after deadlifts than RDLs because both of those movements, because because the RDLs are going to have me sore going into the hamstring curls. So that th- those are some of the things I think about. All right, does this train me at long muscle lengths? Is there a, a large eccentric component? And when I'm at a long muscle length, is the load experienced by the muscle the highest? Um, and that's really just like the muscle damage side of the equation. There's other things that go into fatigue that we've talked about. Um, you know, like I think the general rule of why is a compound exercise, quote unquote, more fatiguing? Well, like I think most people understand this, like a... Uh, a leg press and a squat train most of the same muscle groups except for the lumbar. But the squat is generally just makes you feel more beat up and it takes a lot more mental effort to get into it. It's a more technically demanding movement. Um, and it's actually loaded, you know, just simply having to brace against it and having a bar on your back. So, man, like when I have to do a hack squat at the start of a leg day or a barbell back squat at the start of a leg day, even though both are should be pretty similar it's just i have to just get a lot more of my mental energy up and ready to go to get into a squat and i find that that negatively affects my performance on everything else after it a little more Mm -hmm. so yeah i think i think there's a a bit more of the intangibles of fatigue or i should say qualitative psychological maybe even elements of fatigue that you have to think about as well yeah and then like something like a squat or a deadlift i think people underestimate the one, your ability to get in those positions to the fact that for a lot of people, depending on their back squats, a lot of upper body fatigue. If you have shoulders the next day and your shoulders are trashed from your low bar squat, that's, um, yeah. Cause I think we were just going over overhead press yesterday as a team member. And we were like, Brad was, man, the overhead press one kills, not kills me, amazes me that it's like me. I'm a very, like you already mentioned gymnastics. I'm a flexible person. So I don't really have limitations in any of my lifts, never had. But it wasn't until I started coaching bodybuilders that I was like, oh, that lift's ugly. Like this is mm. for like, um, can you go over, for example, the overhead press things and how many, or I guess we could go over it because we just read it together. Like the the fact that most people can't stand with their arms overhead. Like we'll just start with that yeah. one. And then like, Yeah, what? I can't. Yeah, <laughs> neither can Brandon, neither yeah. can my boyfriend. So... Um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, I was just watching a, um, a video of myself yesterday, not when this comes out, but yesterday for, <laughs> for real time right now. And I was doing um, dumbbell pullovers. And you can see like the, 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 the top point of my rib cage, like just kind of rising as my mm-hmm. arms go down, you know, so I'm not keeping my abs down because that would require me to actually have more shoulder flexion. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. When I was doing Olympic lifting, it took me 15 minutes of specific active and passive stretching to be able to do jerks that weren't quite in, in full flexion, but were sufficient for me to go and, you know, and, and jerk something around 100 kilos or more. Um, so like, yeah, and I also didn't have full elbow extension. So that's, I had terrible mob- mobility for a weightlifter but pretty normal mobility for most bodybuilders, at least most male bodybuilders in my experience as a coach who are in their 30s or older. Um, Like you said, Brandon's in the same boat. Um, And that's so like, so what do you do with that? Well, what what happens is it it produces two different outcomes for two different people. Like when Andrea does overhead press, joints are stacked, not that hard to keep the abs and glutes tight. You're getting a pretty even stimulus between, you know, all all the heads of the delts. And it's all good. Um, For other people, it ends up being this kind of lower back fatiguing standing incline press, you know, Um, and it it tends to produce a whole lot more total fatigue. It takes a little more effort just to kind of do it uh, as close to right as possible, or it just kind of becomes something like you said, that's a little more ugly. And it's this, you know, just kind of this this standing. Well, it's like you said, just if. If you have an overhead press before a squat and your overhead press is, I don't want to say trash, mm, exactly. but like, um, you know, the lower back from that standing incline press uh, can very much carry over to the squat. And you might be a great squatter, but it's like, mm. 
Mm -hmm. Sit down, bro. Get some dumbbells, or or just sit down at exactly. an incline. You could barbell it even, but yeah, just doing a um, kind of accepting the range of mo. Well, like when you're standing, you're gonna put your body in a position to where eventually the weight is straight up over your head. But maybe it's not the position you want your body in, like you said, and that carries lumbar fatigue over into your squats. Mm -hmm. um, so why not sit down? Why not grab dumbbells? I think that's a great, a great, a great example of how do I assess the movement related to my biomechanics, and then what I'm planning to do tomorrow and today. That that's often what the question is, right? Yeah. Another one, speaking of um, a lower body movement uh, that's affecting an upper body movement, is front squats. You know, mm -hmm. so to keep the front rack position. Uh, it takes like, man, doing front squats, especially for even moderately high bodybuilding repetitions, we're talking like four to eight reps with any, even a decent RPE. If you're actually fighting to keep your hips forward, your knees tracking forward, your back as upright as possible, um, that produces a ton of, uh, extension, like upper back extension fatigue and even scapular retraction fatigue. And I think Every time I have done a back day in close proximity to front squats, uh, it doesn't go well, you know, especially the rowing. So yeah, like my lats are fresh, but pretty much everything else is not. So I think people just, when we have these generalities that like the principle based stuff, Hey, you know, do your lower body stuff here or do your compounds here. And it shouldn't, you know, you can go up or lower alternating because that keeps you fresh. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it depends on what you choose and, and how much you do and, and to what, what degree in terms of proximity to failure and volume you, you push the, the overall training load. So, yeah, I think th those are, those are all the, the, the pieces of the puzzle that go into my head. You have to think about what is the lift actually asking my body to do? What are the limits of what my body or my client's body can do? And then, all right, what else do I need to do in the week and how do those things interact? So a lot of the times and this doesn't stay the same either so some exercises are great in specific circumstances but you don't use them that much in other situations so for example a back extension um, which we just added to the recent edition of the lifting library that probably isn't there on a day-to-day -day basis in most bodybuilding programs but you know what is often there on a day-to-day -day basis the squat and a deadlift or variations of a squat and a deadlift they are our highest risk, highest reward exercises. Like they're great. Don't get me wrong. You're training the lumbar, the glutes, the quads, or the hands, depending on whether we're talking about a hinge or a squat, uh, training them through a full range of motion. Uh, and it's a great way to track our progress. And for those uh, of us who compete in dual sports, they're pretty much a necessity if you're a strength athlete and a, and a physique athlete. But like I said, high risk, high reward, I would say between hinges and, and, uh, and squats, that's probably going to account for like two thirds of the injuries you're going to get as, as a lifter, you know, <laughs> at least it has for yeah. me, you know, um, and for, for the majority of my clients. So there's going to be a lot of the time, um, maybe like 10% of your lifting career where you would be like, I don't want to do that right now. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've replaced a hinge with a back extension and you'd be surprised, like, oh, I have a quote unquote back injury. I can't squat or deadlift, but you can actually do a back extension. You find out it's much more load dependent or you can modify the range of motion. Um, and that's a great way to train your lower back, hams and glutes. Um, and or reverse hyper I've had, if you have it too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Reverse hyper, which is the, the same movement, just which, which segment of your body is moving, you know? Yeah. So is it, is it torso on, on hip movement or hip movement on torso movement? Um, and you'll find that it, surprisingly, even though you think this region's hurt, can't do that. So therefore I can't do a back extension. Well, maybe you can do a back extension or maybe if you can't, you can do a reverse hyper, yeah. like you were saying, Andrea. Um, so I've had people who are exclusively doing leg extension, leg curl, calf raise and back extensions or hip thrusts and or hip thrusts, I should say, um, who have not only just held on to the muscle mass that they built from primarily squatting and deadlifting, but even continued to make progress. So, yeah, uh, or, or like our chapter on BFR that came out in the last lifting library one. Mm -hmm. That's a, another tool where you think like, oh, I have, I have knee pain. And uh, therefore, I, of course, I wouldn't be able to do it like a knee extension. Like that's, that's not a good piece of advice. But knee extensions are actually very common rehab tools. They just start very lightweight. What does BFR allow you to do? 
use very lightweight. So I'll, sometimes these aren't necessarily the bread and butter exercises, but they're just like really useful tools for certain circumstances. Um, and the tool is, I think, a great analogy because it's not until you have to fix something very specific that you see the value in some of the tools in a toolkit. Like, oh my God, I need that specific wrench or my house is going to flood. You're pretty happy you had that wrench, even though you only use it once every two years, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. And so you saying, and I know we've, we've all talked about how, like, I think, was it Arnold Weldon? Like had a pretty big... Like mm -hmm. he's been squatting a deadlift yeah, so. his whole life, had an injury, did his, all his isolation still made progress, still looked great on stage, like amazing on stage. Um, so then the question is like, all right, well, if all this talk about considering things and what one exercise also works at the same time, blah, 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 like why wouldn't I just build a body off of just isolation movements? Why doesn't mm -hmm. that work? Why can't I just do that and then never have to worry about this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it, it's something that has been proposed. Like if you go back historically to like the Nautilus days, that was the proposition, you know, because machines were, they weren't actually new. There's been machines for over 100 years. But I would say mass produced wide scale uh, machines by Nautilus were, were probably the first time in, in mass fitness marketing that that message came out. Why would you do a compound exercise when you can isolate and it also came hand in hand with the high intensity training uh, and push it to failure and get everything you can out of it. Like why, why have some other weak link in your squat go to, go to failure and prevent you from doing the movement when you could just really hammer your quads. And you know, that that's another generality. It's, it's a great simplification, but now we have to dive deeper into biomechanics to understand how things work. Like our body doesn't move in isolated fashions. You know, it's always integrated. And the basic anatomy that most bodybuilders get from fitness articles or magazines is a gross simplification. Like when we talk about quote unquote back exercises or quote unquote uh, quad or hamstring exercises or quote unquote uh, chest exercises, there's a lot more that goes into it. So let's go back to my example of a, an isolation quote unquote movement, um, the pullover, right? So this is a great one. You know, mm -hmm. what, what is that train? Like when I, when I ask a bodybuilder, when I'm doing a pullover, what is that? Some, some will say lats, some will say chest. And they don't necessarily know why, because they don't necessarily know the joint actions, but the, the, it, it, they're both right. So the pecs, when you are in, in, in an extreme stretch position and full flexion with your arms, actually are weakly active at the start of that movement. If you think about it, any time a muscle is stretched and you ask it to shorten, it becomes its joint action, right? So when your arms are overhead, like in the bottom of a pull-up or the bottom of a lat pull-down, or even more exaggerated, like we we're talking about in this example, uh, the pullover, if you begin to contract your chest, your arms lift for a bit. So at the beginning of a pullover, it is pecs. Of course, it is your lats the whole time, because what you're doing is shoulder extension, right? But there's also one head of the triceps, which does shoulder extension. You know, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a movement that doesn't fit into any bodybuilding category. Yeah, Cause that's the bottom of a skull crusher too, or a French press, depending on. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's a lat chest and, and tricep exercise, right? What day do you put that on? Yeah. I was gonna say, okay, so then why would I do that if that's interfering with what's before and what's after? I mean, or, or the, or the question is, is, isn't that nice how I can train all three, oh, three well, yeah. actions I guess at the both same ways. time? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe that would lead me to different exercise uh, structures. Maybe now I have upper days instead of a chest or back day. And that fits quite nicely because that trains the whole upper body, you know. Mm -hmm. But I do have to think about where would I put it? You know, maybe it is best at the end because it's training a bunch of everything, everything, right? Yeah. So, but that's just one example. I mean, there's, uh, and part of the, so a, a general concept that can be applied here is the understanding of the difference between a monoarticular and a biarticular muscle. Oh my God. So I know it sounds very, very this science and complicated. It's pretty simple though. So <laughs> okay, a biarticular muscle is just a muscle that crosses two joints. Oh. Okay. So we'll, we'll go with a, uh, a single joint, uh, sorry, a, a monoarticular example, like just your, the bicep on your arm, right? You flex your elbow and you do a curl and it trains the bicep. And the other, the, the biceps complex, we'll say. It's pretty straightforward uh, when it comes down to it. Um, 
However, the other bicep, the one on the back of your leg, um, that is a biarticular muscle, right? It not only does knee flexion, it also does hip extension. So if you have a very kind of basic understanding of the way the biceps femoris, your hamstrings work, you think, all right, if it does hip extension, well, when I do squats, squats, train, glutes, hamstrings, quads, great. Eh, not so much, because if you think about it, when you're trying to squat, you don't want to do knee flexion. That's like pulling you down into the squat. That's actively going against what your quadriceps are doing, the prime mover of the squat. And in fact, when we look at data on squats, we see very low EMG values for the hamstring. And we see minimal or no hypertrophy of the hamstring when especially train lifters are doing only squats. So the hamstrings are relatively quiescent, which is a fantastic word. Great I word. I do love yeah. it. Uh, when, when you're doing squats because they're opposing the action of the, the, the overall compound movement. Um, so now we start to see some issues with, with kind of looking at just the basic joint actions of movements and being a little more oversimplified. Um, so going back to the, the, uh, the triceps example, the long head of the triceps, it is a shoulder extensor and an elbow extensor. So yeah, you can train it doing shoulder extension uh, when you're doing, say, the uh, like the pullover. And that's probably a good idea. That's a useful exercise because when you're doing a bench press, you wouldn't want shoulder extension because that's going to be opposing the anterior deltoid, which does shoulder flexion. You know, a bench press primarily trains your pecs and anterior delts. So therefore, you're not going to be hitting that head of your triceps very effectively. So you need to do some isolation in addition to uh, the, the compounds to make sure that you train the whole uh, the whole system. Uh, and that's where, where, where leg extensions are useful. Uh, so we've got the quadriceps, that quad is four. There's four muscles in the quadriceps. Run of, one of them is the, the rectus femoris. So that does not only knee extension, it's not just a monoarticular muscle like the rest of the quadriceps. It's also biarticular. It also does hip flexion. So like when you bring your your knee up towards your chest. So now again, when we're doing a squat, when I'm trying to stand up, I'm trying to do hip extension, not hip flexion. I don't want my knees going to my chest when I'm trying to stand up, that's getting pinned. So again, we see that the rectus femoris is not trained very well by the squat. So the, the squat purists, because like you said, hey, why not only do isolation exercises? Well, we don't actually move that way. Why not only do compound exercises? It's more efficient, it trains multiple muscle groups at once. Well, yeah, so if your whole lower body day is simply squats and calf raises, you're not getting much out of your hamstrings or the rectus femoris. It's great for the vasti muscles, lateralis, medialis. Uh, it's great for the glutes, but it's definitely leaving out a few muscle groups that are essentially would be counterproductive if they were producing a lot of force during the squat, like the hamstring and the rectus femoris. So now we see, okay, I've got to do some knee flexion and I've got to do some isolated knee extension if I want to get complete development. And that's uh, as a bodybuilder. Because a again, a power correct. lifter might not need to. It doesn't really matter. Worry about like, that. You know, it is, yeah, if you're a power lifter, right? So your rectus femoris. Oh my God, it's not trained very well in the squat. Uh, what do I? What am I going to do? I need to do some knee extensions. Well, well, why? It's not trained very well because it's not active, so it's not contributing. So it's not going to probably yeah. make much of a difference. Um, you know, want to make your your singlet look a little better? Get a few more more separation points and the quadricep. Go for it. I'm not going to stop you, but yeah. um, it's it's probably not a key element of what will transfer to your squat performance. Yeah, and it sounds so. If I'm like a I'm in my first year of lifting or something, and I hear this podcast, I'm like, what the hell do I need an anatomy class? Do I need a biomechanics class? Like, do you think the average lifter needs to know all this? Uh, the average lifter, no, probably not. You know, um, and I think like it, it is a perfectly valid thing to say, you know what, whatever I get out of bodybuilding, I don't want to re it, it to require this level of depth. That's not me, bro. And I'm like, that's all good. Um, that's that's why I'm here, though, is to right. try to take all those things and put it into the simplest form possible. Um, and I think, God, I'm forgetting who the exact quote is. It might be Einstein. He just gets attributed all these quotes. But everything should be explained in the simplest form as possible, but no simpler. Right? Right. And if someone is like, hey, if you want to make great gains, 
focus on compound movements, you know, start with, you want a horizontal press, horizontal pull, vertical press, vertical pull, hinge in a squat, and then identify specific muscle groups and do additional isolation work on them to round out your physique. That is, that is true. And that is probably the simplest form possible. You know, I did that in a couple sentences. And I think that is a very good way to go for almost anybody. And you may not even need to go deeper than that ever. Um, yeah. But then let's say, you know what I want to do? I want to become a coach. I want to start uh, writing programs for people. You like you don't get to just be happy with your level of ignorance if you're now putting <laughs> other people's goals in your hands. Right. Yeah. You, n- now you have a duty of care. Right. Yeah. Um, it's not just taking the same program that worked for you, bro, and then giving it to people and charging them money. Um, although that is what men I was going to say, unfortunately. you might think that's what it is because we have a lot of that <laughs> and you've seen that. Yes, that has but... been modeled for us, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> likewise, like, let's say uh, you've built a good physique and now you go, you know what, I actually want to get on stage and I want to, I want to become a professional. Like uh, I would say most people who compete in bodybuilding who I've met, whether they get it wrong or right, they do delve to this, this level of depth because they are asking their bodies to do extreme things. So is it really unreasonable to ask them to become a student of the sport to some degree? Yeah. I, I don't think it is unreasonable. Um, and I've seen a lot of people hold themselves back because they they don't want to do it like that. I think that's that's not the spirit of bodybuilding. It's like, let's get in there and, and listen to this bro wisdom and and trained hard, you know, and I think that's, that's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I love that kind of cultural aspect of, of bodybuilding, but that that's not precluded by simply thinking about how my body works. Yeah. You know, I think too, like personally, what will cause you to learn real quick is when you get hurt or when mm. something doesn't look the way I want to look like, Oh, my body looks great. My shoulders are tiny. Okay. Let's learn about shoulder anatomy Let's go in the lifting library and look at how do these five ex- five shoulder exercises work together, blah, blah, blah. And then again, of course, when you're hurt, like you said, your back hurts. All right, well, I still want to keep my ass growing. So what are the five things I can do then? And so it's like it almost, if you hear this podcast, and you're like, wow, that's a lot. Well, it's like if you focus on one at a time and not even on purpose, like I said, it's almost like your body will do it for you. Like, oh, I have to learn about this because... I want to keep going to the gym and this thing hurts or I have to learn about mm-hmm. this because it's a very weak point on my physique and I'm frustrated. So. Yeah. And I think there's um like your standard way things are set up can lead to some frustration for some people. Like let's say your standard leg day. Yeah. You do leg press followed by RDL. Right. Um, and you're someone who is trying to get uh, more posterior chain development. And um, you notice that you're just, like RDLs are, are just not getting the job done, you know? The technique could be an issue. Uh, the the fact that you're performing leg press first could be an issue. You know, like exercise order is, is also something. We have good data to suggest you get better adaptations from the thing you do first. Mm-hmm. Um, could be because you're, you're fresh, uh, more mentally able to put focus onto it, less fatigue, of course. Um, so, yeah, it might be that adding an exercise, changing exercises, or changing exercise order is is what you might benefit from. And that's something like we cover, uh, you mentioned it earlier, like overhead pressing and uh, and flat pressing. So like most of the time in your upper body programs, if, if you have an upper lower split, you're always going to be doing bench press or flat dumbbell press or incline or whatever before you get to your shoulder work. Like the standard upper body setup, you focus on the horizontal pressing prior to the vertical pressing. Um, you know, that makes sense. When you do a horizontal press, it's not only your chest and triceps, it's also your anterior deltoid. And when you do a vertical press, theoretically, it's mostly just anterior to some degree, middle deltoid and triceps, right? So it, it seems like it should go after it because one is a chest delt and tricep exercise and one's just a delt and tricep exercise. So order of operations, train the compounds, which hit more muscle groups first, right? Easy peasy. Well, what if you need to build your delts more than anything else? Then maybe you take the hit on your delts being in your triceps being a little fatigued when you go into your bench or or your or, or your or chest press, uh, or maybe you have to think about different exercise structures entirely, uh, and you have a standard upper day, but then when you come in on your leg day, you start with lateral raises or military press. You know, 
So I think some people wouldn't know when it's appropriate to break the quote unquote rules without going through that process of thinking about it and identifying their weaknesses and then thinking about, okay, so, so why does chest press make my overhead press performance worse? You know? Yeah. And, I, and that, that's a more simple one. I think people have, you know, that you don't need a, a degree in anatomy to, to realize that there's a lot of similarity between pressing over your chest and pressing over your head. You know? Yeah. And then not losing your shit and understanding, okay, when I do swap this order, I'm not actually weaker at bench press. It's just like, because I made this decision that cause and effect or whatever. Hey friends, just popping in to let you guys know that Eric's audio file from his external microphone somehow got cut off for the rest of the episode. So he'll still be here for another 20 something minutes, giving you all his usual knowledge bombs and even finishing with an amazing summary of takeaways and all that jazz. But he just won't sound quite as crisp because you'll be hearing the native Skype call audio instead of what comes from the fancy mic. Anyway. Thanks for sticking around and enjoy the rest of the show. I am biased because I know it's our product and this is going to be a, a commercial, but I don't even care, is that this was missing for me, I think, for a long time, personally. And I think missing for a lot of lifters, it's like you think you can do a movement. And me, again, personally, I'm a pretty decent mover because of my gymnastics background. I'm like, well, got it. Like, got my lifts down. So like, okay, that's it. They should just work. Everything should just work. And I'm doing the the two sentence system that you said earlier, I'm doing my compounds in all these planes before I do my isometric. So it's all supposed to work. But again, then you get hurt or then you realize like my upper body is much less developed than my lower. And like, um, and I think the only way to learn, or I'm just saying like, I think I learned that way slower than I had to because if I had it the way that we have it in this course, that's like, here's a list of 20 to 30 exercises and every single one is going to tell you why or the program and consideration list. This is where it fits in with the program. This, if you prefer strength, this is where that fits in. If you want to worry about both of these exercises and strength, you should alternate your horizontal and your vertical pressing to start your day, blah, blah, blah. And like that comprehensive, not just waiting till I get hurt and studying the one, which again is fine. And it's what a lot of us do. But like here I can see 20 different exercises and 20 lists of what Eric Helms thinks about when he's programming this exercise. And it just like uh, speeds that curve up so much quicker. And I'm just like so freaking proud that we can offer that. And that wasn't a question for you. I just wanted to say that. Well, no, I really appreciate that, that feedback because <laughs> um, it's yeah, I think the, the first off the videos are awesome. And that's the easiest thing for us to explain to people when we talk about like this is useful because like it shows you how to do it there's visual cues brandon is an awesome video editor right like so it's visually stimulating it's fun to watch you know we put we have you know a bunch of them on our youtube etc it's it's a lot more difficult to communicate to people the the learnings that are there in the program and considerations because it's a you know it's a couple pages of text um, with, with links to, to studies and things like that. But it's also arguably just as important as the, the, the technique itself that the, like the, the prime piece of the lifting library. And I am the same way. Like I was plateaued and I wouldn't say plateaued. I, I was at a less good <laughs> physique development just killing it with the english today um <laughs> because of those uh, of lack of knowledge there like i didn't really understand how to train my lats for a long time um i think beyond just kind of understanding like yeah you do rows and lat pull downs and lat pull downs are better for your lats and rows are better for like i kind of believe in like the back width back thick back thickness thing Okay. And I didn't really think about it from the actual joint actions and, you know, what are the synergist muscles and, you know, how do I actually get that to happen when I'm in the gym? And I also had overdeveloped lower body relative to my upper body. So I needed to figure out ways to increase the volume on my upper body without that, like kind of throwing off my whole program, you know, mm -hmm. and that's led me to a relatively unique split and uh to being very focused on how do i perform back exercises and it fundamentally changed my physique 
uh, even though I don't think I'm like way more muscular than I was in say 2007 or nine, I'm far more balanced mm -hmm. and I have a higher quality physique, if you will, because of that. So like this stuff, yeah, like it, for some people, it just won't make a difference. Like if you got the perfect muscle bellies and biomechanics and no injury history, et cetera. Yeah. You just train and you'll be awesome. Um, but, that's but if like, you coach, exactly. If you coach, then you're not going to understand why all your clients suck. Uh, and it's because you know, you have it through the lens of your own experience, which is of course limited. So yeah, I think essentially, you know, if we get back to what the thought process it's all right, what is going to produce fatigue in this session? And then in subsequent sessions, how long is it going to last? What are my priorities? If my priorities shift, then what would I change? And how do these exercises interact with one another? Um, like, what's an appropriate rep range for these exercises? You know, that that's not a part of the uh, the performance either. So, so for example, if something is highly technically demanding and has multiple muscle groups, which if they fatigue you will hit failure or the performance of the exercise will change. Then you have to think about, well, do I want to be doing 15 reps, you know, yeah. or, or would I rather do six to eight? Um, so th that, that's the type of consideration, you know, like in a lot of the times you'll see that just kind of built into programs with no real explanation, like, Oh, it's six to eight on RDL and squat. And then we do, you know, eight to 12 on leg press. And then we do 12 to 15 on leg extension, leg curl. Why? You know, if you understand why, then when that stock standard program stops working for you, you can alter it and make modifications and, and get after it. Um, and that's why sometimes, you know, it, like I've talked to my clients and they come to me and like one of their days is like squat, hack squat, leg press, and the reps are all high. And I'm just like, and maybe just squats low. And they go, well, I, I heard that from powerlifting. Like I, so I'm doing triples on squats and then I do tens on everything else. And I'm like, well, first off, you've got no real reason to do triples on squats as a bodybuilder. Second, you're doing hack squats after squats and then leg press after squats. So why are we basically doing nine sets of squats on one day? Do you, <laughs> yeah. how is that leg press performance if you start with it? Oh, I can put two more plates on there. Okay, so how effective do you think it is if you're like just hemorrhaging load uh, by the time you get there? Probably not that good. Okay, so let's just move this around a little bit, you know, and let's yeah. let's not, you know, do your three RM to start show off a leg day when you're also trying to do ten sets, you know. So that's yeah. that's the type of thing where I've had competitive athletes, even pros sometimes, and you can tell that this is a missing piece of knowledge for them. This is something they don't fully understand. They understand hard work uh, and they maybe even understand which exercises do which things, but how they should be placed together in a given week of training is something that I think maybe I, I, I underestimate how often people don't know how to do that. But once I started coaching, it was, it became very apparent to me. It was a common issue. Yeah. And, uh, for those people, like for a lot of people, just doing more works for a really long time. And so like, it's hard to, like, you might be listening to this and be like, well, I just let my volume and everything's going great. It's like, cool. But again, come to us in two years when something else happens or just hire a coach also. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Like the, yeah. like the standard, I don't want to pick on any division or anything, but like, I'm, I, this is, a, and this is a stereotype, <laughs> but, but like the standard bikini it. competitor leg day where it's essentially like five different isolation exercises for the glutes. I can't tell you how many times we have restructured that so that it's more intentional. Uh, instead of always kind of being in third gear, you know, and just doing it all, we go, all right, so we've got multiple days to train. Which one of these train the glutes at a long muscle length? Which one of these require you to actually load your, your body axially, axially pick up a heavy barbell, et cetera. How's that going to affect other things? And let's distribute this differently and maybe actually only do two, two thirds of that volume and, and, and those exercises. And we get just as, as, as good or if not better results. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's so not an isolated incident. That's like what we do with most of our bikini competitors who work with us yeah. with pretty reliable outcomes. So I think it applies. And I think that's a great example. Like most people don't know how to do good specialization blocks. It's kind of just like, it's not even the shotgun effect. It's like, let me pick up two shotguns and do the Terminator 2 thing and just shoot. <laughs> you know? 
um, and not thinking about, all right, well, when I'm holding two shotguns, I, I can't have a cup of tea. Like, hold, hold on, this is affecting other things, you know? Like, yeah. so, yeah, how do we up the volume on a given exercise, on, on a given muscle group in a way that gets the most bang for buck and then doesn't negatively affect other things? Um, like, if you don't want your quads to suffer while you focus on hamstrings and glutes, how do you do that? You know? And uh, so, yeah, like, Thinking about distribution, exercise order, uh, exercise selection, and the rep ranges and proximity to failure in those instances for each exercise is really what it comes down to. Um, If you want to do 20 sets for a given muscle group, where would this exercise fit in? That type of thing, you know? Yeah. Okay, so we've talked a lot about muscle damage, and we've almost exclusively talked about it as a bad thing so far in this thing. Like, we're avoiding it. We're da-da-da. So, like, how... But we kind of need it. So, like, where's that sweet spot? How do you find it? How would I feel through that for myself? Great question. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. So, like I said, um, muscle damage occurs when you're cl- pushing close to failure, doing more damage. Uh, sorry, uh, pushing closer to failure, doing more volume, training at long muscle lengths, right? All three of those things also cause more muscle growth, right? So, like, um, we, we're not we're, we're not going to be like, all right, let's train to a five RPE, only do one set per muscle group and train at short muscle lengths only. That's a great way to not change at all. So yeah. we do have to like we have to do hard things, you know, and we can do hard things. Um, it's just a matter of accounting for it. So, for example, uh, we'll, we'll keep going back to this hamstring example because I think it's, it's, it's a, a great one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say uh, you are a dual athlete. You want to pull from the floor. That's something you want to be good at. So we do that when you're nice and fresh on Monday. Let's say you've got a a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, four day split. That's a pretty common upper lower split, right? Mm-hmm. So you got the weekend and Wednesday off. Not bad. So um, you're thinking about, well, how do I get all this work split between just my two lower days? Well, if you want to get like if hamstrings are a weak point, maybe we have upper plus something else. You know, it's, 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 you're going to be okay, right? So let's say on uh, on Monday, we just do your deadlifts on the floor. No big deal. That that That's pretty much what you're doing for your hamstring training, okay? We can maybe do some hamstring curls afterwards. Uh, no big deal. Uh, Tuesday, we don't do anything. That, that is your pure upper body day, okay? Now, Thursday, we're coming back, and now we're going to do your other upper body day. That's a little different. We went lower, upper, upper, lower, but we had that Wednesday, Wednesday day off, no big deal. And we're going to do some, let's say, lying hamstring curls. So now we're training your hamstrings, and they are at a short muscle length. So not a big deal, right? Shouldn't produce a lot of damage, even if you're still a little fatigued from those deadlifts and maybe hamstring curls you did on Monday. Not a big deal. Upper body should be good to go. You trained it 48 hours ago, and if it wasn't too hard and it wasn't too crazy, this can be your harder session, or you can flip that. Either way, it wouldn't matter. Then on Friday, that's when you do your RDLs, right? So now it's been a full, uh, it's Friday versus Monday for when you did deadlifts. You should be good to go for, for RDLs. And all you did yesterday was three sets of lying hamstring curls. You didn't push to failure. It's relatively low volume, long muscle length, not too close to failure. You'd probably be pretty fresh. Now RDLs, yeah, you can do like say four sets of eight, at a you know seven to nine rpe pushing you're, you're going to get really sore but guess what you put it on the day where you now you have two days in a row off so you're mm-hmm. probably going to be fine so i think that is an example of we're purposely selecting a highly damaging exercise that and, and pushing it for overload but we're doing it in a status where we should be fresh so the performance is good to go and we're going all right where would i put this exercise that's going to produce high overload and therefore high damage so that I'll have the optimal recovery phase after it. So, I mean, yeah. that that's something where not all programs, like if you're training five days a week, you never have two days off in a row. Um, but I would say most people are probably training four days a week. That's kind of probably the, I mean, maybe there's probably plenty who train five days a week. But for people who train four days a week, that's a great kind of little shortcut mentally is, if I take the movements that produce a lot of muscle damage, that's fine. I should put them on the day prior to when I have two days off because you're always going to have two days off, right? Yeah, that's a good example. Man, okay. Well, I feel like you've done a tremendous job at explaining uh, not just what programming considerations are, 
but how it's different than exercise selection and why the lifting library is probably the best thing that everybody needs right now. But if you want to sum that up, Eric, you can you can do that right here. Yeah, absolutely. So this is not just purely a commercial that makes you think, oh, geez, there's so much. I could never do this without the lifting library. I better go buy it. Um, to give, like, because I, I fully understand, like, 90% of our podcast followers are not going to purchase the lifting library, and that is okay. Um, it so is let me okay, give you some summary of the practical take homes. Um, okay. Exercises that train uh, at you at a long muscle length, especially when the tension is the highest at that long muscle length are going to produce high levels of muscle damage. That's fine. Those exercises also generally produce more muscle growth. Uh, we have data to suggest uh, that seated hamstring curls, for example, uh, produce more hamstring hypertrophy than lying hamstring curls for that exact reason. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't use them. In fact, you should use them. But it's not to say that you should use them willy-nilly without thinking about it. So when you have exercises that produce uh, lingering soreness, muscle damage, and fatigue afterwards, you want to think about their placement so that you have an adequate recovery period. Um, this also goes just for compound movements that actually load you that are technically demanding and they're free weight. So your your free weight uh, compound exercises, uh, those are also ones you want to think about the recovery and overlap. Uh, you want to think about, okay, what are some of the biarticular muscles that, that, that I need to consider so that I make sure that I do get isolation training for them. Uh, the big ones that often come up in bodybuilding training are the rectus femoris, the hamstrings, uh, and then the long head of the triceps. And also think about what exercises that are often trained only through compound movements do I need to isolate as well. So for example, the biceps femoris short head only does knee flexion, doesn't do hip extension. So for both the purists on the isolation side or the purists on the compound side, uh, maybe be a little less pure get dirty with everyone else and uh, and consider yes. when and where to use those exercises. Then also consider what is the appropriate proximity to failure, so your RPE, if you will, or RIR, how close to failure, how many reps in the tank do I have left, and rep ranges that best fit with the demands of these given exercises, right? So uh, should I really be doing 15 reps to a 9 to 10 RPE on squats or deadlifts? Probably not. Uh, th that is probably not a risk worth the reward. Uh, probably far more better suited to take that same load and just train at a slightly lower RPE with fewer reps. So hit that for 8 to 12 at most. You know. Uh, likewise, when you are isolating a muscle, you're also isolating a joint. And you're putting a lot of load through that joint if you're going heavy on something like a leg extension. So don't typically recommend like four to six reps on a leg extension. Um, that's a fantastic uh, opportunity for you to do higher reps, you know, uh, and, and put a little less joint stress through it and just kind of get some volume accumulated and in, in intensity through uh, going closer to failure with more reps. So appropriate RPE, appropriate rep range for the exercise, and then a appropriate placement of the exercise based on how much fatigue it's going to produce. Uh, mental fatigue also counts, you know, like if, if you don't get too beat up uh, physically, like you have happy joints, uh, you're young, and squats and deadlifts are okay, but they really require a lot of focus and attention, and you kind of get intimidated going into them, okay, think about that too. And, and, and then what do you have to do afterwards, and how negatively does that affect your performance? If you are doing a, a lower body that's heavily dominated by compound movements, you've got five sets of squats, five sets of deadlifts, and then you just get a little bit of smattering of accessories, if the second compound movement and the accessories suffer, maybe do more sets on the accessories or, or an, an additional isolation accessory movement and just cut the sets down to three on those two movements. Um, so that's kind of the, the big picture take homes is really just trying to get the most stimulus while minimizing the fatigue by thinking about proximity to failure, RPE, exercise selection and placement within the week and within the session. Easy enough. Yeah. So just do that. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much, Eric. This is very, very helpful, I believe, for the listeners. Uh, regardless of what you buy, like I said, we're just we're happy that you're here and we're happy we can give this information. And thank you for all the time and effort you put into making this for us, Eric. Oh, it's a pleasure. All right. See y'all next time. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget the lifting library sale ends in six days and you can take advantage of that at 3dmjvault.com. If you're not sure yet, go to that website and get a free trial. 
No card info is required. Just create a login and you'll get five full chapters for free. You'll get to see all the videos and all the text supplements to a few different exercises to try it on and see if it's a good fit for you. We appreciate your attention and support, and we'll catch you next time on the 3D Muscle Journey podcast.